Good morning. I would like to welcome you all to Harvest Fellowship. I'd like to welcome those joining us on the live stream. Thank you for doing that. So, I don't know what's going on. Anybody heard anything good in the news lately? <laughs> you know, maybe uh, um, a court decision starts to get us all excited about what's going on in the country or in the world. Maybe a legislative bill is passed and we don't agree with it and that we feel like things are closing down on us. We had this court decision this week and the rhetoric on both sides just amped to this crescendo. And we can be excited or we can be frustrated or we can you know, just not know what to think sometimes. I kind of feel like on this issue of um, abortion that the battle is not done and that there's a long way to go. And regardless of where you might stand on the situation, as my wife so often reminds me in these cases, Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so we come in contact all the time with people who have different opinions on different subjects. They are not the enemy. Right? We wrestle against spiritual forces. And to pray for those people, to pray for the situation to put our trust not in the legislature, not in the executive branch, not in the courts, but in God. We put our trust in God and he will see us through and he, he may have to carry us through some very difficult and dark times and he may bring us into some glorious and wonderful times. But it's God that we serve. We serve him, we worship him, we gather here this morning to do that. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that these battles that we face in everyday life, that these battles that happen in, in the course of a public sphere, that they are yours, they belong to you. Father, we thank you that we are your people. And we thank you that even when things might seem to go away, we want them to go, that it's you who's at work and you who are shaping the course of events. And when things are difficult and when things seem headed for darkness, even then we put our trust in you. And so, Father, we gather this morning to acknowledge that you are the sovereign ruler of all. We put ourselves at your feet. We thank you for this opportunity to assemble before you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand with me. Our call to worship comes from Isaiah chapter 40, and it reminds us that God is the one who is strong. Please read responsively with me. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He is power to the faint. To him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong. Everlasting God, the everlasting God. 
What does it mean to wait upon the Lord? I was listening yesterday to a teaching that talked about some of the spiritual disciplines and it included in the list solitude and silence. As I was thinking about that, solitude and silence are ways that we can wait upon the Lord. Our lives get so busy. We have so much going on. Sometimes uh, when we simplify and we just relax and get away from it all and wait upon the Lord, that's where we can see his strength.
The scripture reading for today comes from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, and chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. You can find it on page 1003 of your pew Bibles. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the him who was able to save him, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Please stand. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. My
Morning. This morning I'd like to talk to you a little bit about SMILE. Let's see if this is working. SMILE's a nonprofit organization that was set up in 1991 to meet the needs of um, the people in Calvert County, Southern Calvert County. And this is a list of some of the churches that are, all of the churches, all 10, that have uh, expanded since, since we started. Smiles along, um, along, oh my goodness, this is going. <laughs> I don't know why it's automatically advancing. Smiles located on Truman Road in Lusby, and probably most of you um, see it quite a bit um, <laughs> as you drive by to church, as a matter of fact. So um, what SMILE does, SMILE operates a food pantry that's funded mostly by a thrift store that uh, sells um, clothes, the food pantry, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> uh, the clothes and the um, household goods and furniture that the, um, the thrift store sells, and uh, they're very good prices and very, um, clothes are in good shape, the furniture's in good shape, they take donations from the community, and um, Anybody who wants to shop there, it's open to anyone, and uh, you get very good prices, and the prices go to fund the food pantry who will, um... <laughs> yes. Okay, is that what's happening? Thank you. <laughs> okay. And when you're ready, just let us know. Okay, stop right there if you can stop it. <laughs> Um, the food pantry, um, not only, they use the funds from the um, thrift shop to buy goods from Maryland Food Bank and National Food Banks, and they get frozen meat and various other goods. They also get donations from um, farms, fresh produce from places like um, Bernie Fowler's Farming for Hunger, um, Middleham Garden, Serenity Farms, and Chesapeake's Bounty, and uh, so that, that our clients and that is anyone who lives in um, Southern Calvert County from Brooms Island South can register and get a bag of food every week um, as well as uh, other goods, the donated foods. The bags of food are, in fact, Doug Ayers is one of our uh, volunteers there who packs the bags that are set up for people um, who come visit. Um, and so the bags are determined by the number of people in, in a household. So if there's one person, they get one bag. If there's a family of five, they may get five bags. Um, so, let's see, uh, children's clothes are a really important uh, section of the uh, thrift store because our clients may have, um, may have children who need clothes and if they are in need, they get vouchers. Anyone who registers, again, can get vouchers for free children's clothes because um, that's a major expense for the, uh, as the children are growing and constantly need new clothes, as most of you know. <laughs> Um, at once a month, so um, the first Monday, first Wednesday of every month, um, Smile has a mobile career center that comes by and run by the county, and they give training, um, advice for training, and, and uh, computer access for people to fill out applications for jobs, and um, they give a little guidance and counseling. And then the second Wednesday of every month, they uh, the the mobile, sorry, the Calvert Bookmobile the library's bookmobile comes by and people are allowed to um, check out books that way. Um, let's see what else we have. Other events that don't include the food pantry, we have a Good Friday ecumenical service at Our Lady Star of the Sea every Good Friday. We have um, a baccalaureate service for high school seniors at Patuxent High. Um, there's also a free turkey dinner given. It's uh, the Saturday before Thanksgiving. Anybody who registers can get a frozen turkey and all the fixings, um, and that's in addition to the food they get every week. And then also there's a holiday dinner at the, um, in Lusby at the uh, um, American Legion, thank you. <laughs> I forgot the name. At the American Legion, and that's open to everybody in the community, and you can get a pretty decent deal, uh, meal there. They have uh, turkey, again, it's a full turkey meal, um, and it's free to the community. And so if we can get there, so here are the hours that the um, food bank is open, and Wednesday, I'm sorry, the thrift store is open, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, um, and then also at from 10 to 1.15, they accept donations, they're open till 2, and then um, Saturday, they're open from 10, uh, 9 to 11.15. Uh, donations are accepted only during those times, so you can't just drive up and leave something there. 
And they're always in need of volunteers, people to sort and accept donations. The thrift store operates with about 100 different volunteers. Um, and so they can use any kind of help, any kind of labor. Uh, I have applications here for, um, if anyone's interested, let me know. There's uh, plenty of information here that you can apply to be a volunteer. You can check with them, or you can just go to Smile and talk to them and see what kind of jobs they want, uh, what they need. So um, how can you help? Well, you can help by shopping at the thrift store. And it, it's not just for the clients that are in need of help. It's for everybody. And you can find some good deals there, some nice clothes. And um, they even have furniture. There's also a furniture pickup. If you call them and arrange a truck will come and pick up uh, furniture if you want to donate it. It's got to be in good condition, but they will, um, they will pick it up at your house and bring it to Smile. And that's a major fundraiser as well. So um, thank you. So years ago, our oldest son, Joshua, wanted a Green Bay Packer themed room. I don't know why he would want that. And, and we went to Smile and we picked up a dresser that was in pretty good shape, but it, it needed to be refinished. So I refinished it in green and gold and uh, put it in the room. And then Joshua moved on and Jonathan inherited the Green Bay Packer room. Again, I have no idea why he didn't want him to be in there. And that dresser is still there, still holding Jonathan's clothes and still functioning like what, 20 years later? So uh, good stuff from Smile. Would you pray with me? Father, we do thank you that uh, as part of your family of faith in, in the southern part of this county that we can be part of what you are doing through Smile. And we pray that you would continue to bless that ministry, bless that work through the various outreaches they have, the uh, baccalaureate service, the Good Friday service, the meals for Thanksgiving and Christmas, Father, we especially pray that you would uh, strengthen the staff there with volunteers. And if there's anyone here that you would call, that we would respond to your call, the volunteer there in the uh, thrift shop to help with that. Father, we pray that it would be uh, profitable for the ministry, that money would be raised to provide the food for the people in need in this community. And Lord, we pray that through this outreach of all of these churches working together, that you would touch the hearts of those in need. And that it would be more than just having their needs met in a physical sense, but that in a spiritual sense, you would call them to yourself and bring them to know life in Christ. Father, thank you for our opportunity to be partners with SMILE. Father, we also thank you for our partnership with Grace Community Church in Cherokee, North Carolina. And we pray specifically for Scott and Ruth as they seek to minister to that community. Lord, we ask that you would sustain them, give them opportunities to enter into the community, to share the gospel. We pray that the numbers at the Grace Community would grow and that more people there would come to know Christ as their savior. We thank you for the opportunities we've had in the past to send teams to participate in summer missions there and we pray lord that you would guide us as we continue our relationship with them and father we also ask for your blessing on the nigh people in india an unreached people group with uh, no evangelical christian presence Father, we ask that you would give them an increasing hunger to learn about Jesus and that you would raise up a strong movement to bring whole families and communities into a rich experience of your blessing among that people group. That those who do come to know you would become effective and fruitful in sharing and discussing Bible stories with their own and with other families and that many from this people group would experience and respond to your holiness. Lord, thank you that you are capable of making inroads into places that look hard, that look impossible. And Father, we pray that you would continue to do that and would bring many to know you. Father, we pray for our own 
members, our own people here, particularly those who are battling with disease, illness, discomfort. Father, we pray that you would bring them healing, put their hearts and minds at peace. Comfort them. Help them to know your presence and to rest in you. We pray for those families who will be traveling over the summer for safety and protection. We pray that you would bless our time of fellowship with our family and friends as we have opportunities to see people we might not see as we travel and to share the gospel with them. We thank you, Lord, for our women's fellowship and we praise you for their opportunity to gather together and to encourage one another through fellowship. We pray that you would continue to bless this monthly fellowship and we thank you for those who are organizing and planning it. And Father, we turn ourselves now to you and to your word. Father, as the word is preached in this place, <clears throat> as it penetrates our hearts, as, as it moves within us, Father, would you cause it to move outward from us as well? That we would be excited about what you're doing in our lives and share that with our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers, our families. We pray that you would bring many new people into this place, that they might hear your word and respond to it as well. Father, we thank you for all that you are doing in this church, all you are doing through this church. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Good morning. I'll not be using PowerPoint this morning. <laughs> no. Thank you, Betsy. That was a wonderful uh, testimony and... Uh, uh, tribute to our partnership with Smile, and uh, yeah, it's great to partner with local agencies, uh, both in word and in deed. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles uh, to Psalm 77. Psalm 77, it's on page 488 in the Bibles and the chairs underneath the seats in front of you, and I invite you to take that uh, Turn that uh, to seven, Psalm 77 with me. And uh, for those that are new with us, don't, maybe don't have a Bible, we invite you to take one of those hardback Bibles home to be your own, to have the Word of God in your own hands. Uh, we're beginning a new series this morning, uh, somewhat the summer in the Psalms, but particularly focusing on the cries of the soul, a Psalms uh, that uh, express our emotion and how do we uh, deal with how do we look at emotions from with the eyes of faith how do we look at these things that we experience every day uh, and how do we use them uh, in our relationship with the lord and the psalms are very helpful uh, for that with us so psalm 77 hear now these words from the book that we love i cry aloud to god aloud to God, and He will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Then I said, I will appeal to this, 
to the years of the right hand of, my, of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What is God? What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, they trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters. Yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Emotions are powerful, aren't they? They are powerful. Uh, they are captured in our romance novels. They're captured in our love songs, on and on. Uh, in our songs and in our culture, these, these things are expressed in creative forms. And there are many songs and movies and books that capture our emotions, and they say, that said exactly what I was thinking. That expressed how I was feeling. And the same is true for those of faith. And the question is, what is the place of emotions in our faith? Where do they find their truth? There are two extremes. Uh, there are two extremes when it comes to experience with our emotions and interactions with our faith. And the first is that faith is just thoughtless emotion, right? Just check your brains at the door and come just purely have an emotional experience when it comes to faith. That's a lot of a caricature of, of many religions and, and certainly uh, at times of Christianity. I remember I was uh, spending a, I don't know, like three different times I met with a, a group of Mormons you know, elder so-and-so and elder so-and-so came to my door. By the way, they were much younger than me. I couldn't quite understand them. elders. Anyway, so they came to me. That's what they call themselves. This is Elder Bob. This is Elder Fred. So anyway, they came to my door, and they were trying to share uh, the Book of Mormon with me and convert me to their faith. And what was interesting is, as I pointed out some some contradictions and some skepticism on my part, they said, well, you know what? We're going to pray for you, and we want you to pray that God would make the Book of Mormon real to you. And it was pretty much just based on emotion. And there's that experience at times when people come to church. You just check your brains at the door and just have, a, have an emotional experience, right? But that's not the invitation of our God. That's not the invitation of the Scriptures. And it's interesting, one of the renowned apologists, Christian apologists of our time, well, past, he passed away, but C.S. Lewis, and one of the things that brought him to faith was that he sought to disprove Christianity on an intellectual basis. And God worked through his wrestling with his mind. And it brought, God brought him to himself. But secondly, so that's the extreme. There's one extreme, we said, that is thoughtless emotion. But then there is the other extreme of emotionless faith. It might be a caricature of some strands of, of forms of Christian faith where it's just purely thought. We're, we're not going to engage in any emotion 
Leave your emotions at the door. Come in only with your mind. Right? You're called to suppress your emotion. And the only emotion that Christians are really able to express biblically is joy. You can have joy, but all those other emotions like anger, depression, anxiety, all that, you just need to check it out, check it at the door. Don't bring that into your faith. So what are we to do with our emotions? How are we to interact with them? I love what John Calvin said, great reformer, a French theologian, who said this about the Psalms. I've been accustomed to call this book, I think not inappropriately, an anatomy of all the parts of the soul. For there is not an emotion of which any one can be conscious that is not here represented as in a mirror. Or rather, the Holy Spirit has here drawn to the life of all the griefs, sorrows, fears, doubts, hopes, cares, perplexities. In short, all the distracting emotions with which the minds of men are wont to be agitated. The other parts of Scripture contain the commandments which God enjoined His servants to announce to us. But here the prophets themselves, seeing they are exhibited to us as speaking to God and laying open all their innermost thoughts and affections, call, or rather draw, each of us to the examination of himself in particulars, in order that none of the many infirmities to which we are subject and of many vices with which we abound may remain concealed. It's really heavy duty what Calvin is saying, but he's saying, look, the, the Psalms are anatomy of the soul, and it speaks to, it gives voice to the expressions and the experiences of emotions and what we experience. Tremper Longman says, the Psalms appeal to the whole person. They demand a total response. The Psalms inform our intellect, arouse our emotions, direct our wills, and stimulate our imaginations. When we read the Psalms with faith, we come away changed and not simply informed. And so, the Psalms are saying something to us. Our, or put it this way, our, our emotions are saying something. And this morning I want us to look at three things that the Psalms are saying to us, particularly from this Psalm in Psalm 77. The first is, our, the Psalms reveal, or our cries reveal, our deepest questions about life and faith. You saw right here at the very first verse, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and He will hear me. And in verse 2, my soul refuses to be comforted. Verse 3, I moan, my spirit faints. And verse 4, I am so troubled that I cannot speak. This psalm it's saying, there are emotions, there's anguish. And he expresses them to the Lord. And he cries out and he puts into words the feelings of anguish and trouble. We don't know, and it's, and it's actually instructive for us, we don't exactly know the background or the context for which this psalm was written. And why that's helpful for us is because we can lay that over our experiences. Right? It's not just bound to one person's experience, but the psalmist, like a poet, is putting to words, like a musician or an artist, putting to words or giving voice to our experiences. And here we have the language, the, the language of anguish on the part of the psalmist. The great 19th century preacher, Charles Spurgeon, maybe you know about his experience, his struggles, with his health and depression in his life. 
uh, and he did studies on the Psalms between 1865 through 1885. And during that 20-year period, of course, his health deteriorated. He had neurologia, he had gout, which left him swollen, red, painful limbs, so that he frequently could not walk or even write. He also had debilitating headaches, and with these physical ills became frightful bouts of depression, leading almost to despair. Later, he was forced to leave London for sunnier, drier weather in southern France in November, December, and January. You can imagine. So physical problems that also fed to the emotional state. And he died in the Mediterranean village of Mentone, France. And he wrote, his comments on Psalm 77. He said, Some of us know what it is, both physically and spiritually, to be compelled to use these words. No respite has been afforded us by silence of night, or bed has been a rack to us. Our body has been in torment, and our spirit in anguish. Alas, my God, the writer of this ex exposition well knows what thy servant Asaph meant. For his soul is familiar with the way of grief, deep glens and lonely caves of soul depressions. My spirit knows full well your awful glooms. Isn't that rich? It's helpful for us that here Spurgeon saw himself in the psalm, saw all of his experiences, and he saw this psalm speaking to his experiences and voicing his anguish, engaging his deepest questions and doubts, right? Is God there for me, right? What are our emotions saying to us? And the psalms reveal that. It brings out in our own cries of emotion reveals our deepest questions, struggles about life and faith. The question is, what are our cries saying? Did you see, <clears throat> in, there's a six repetitious or rhetorical questions here where beginning, where the psalmist begins to say, okay, here's my question. Question to God, will the Lord reject forever will he never show his favor again has his unfailing love vanished forever has his promise failed for all time has god forgotten to be merciful has him has his anger withheld his compassion deep questions you see how those questions, the experiences of anguish, have led him to questions about God. And questioning, is God good? Is he able to meet? Has he stopped being gracious? Is he only gracious to this person, but not gracious to me? That's what the experience of our emotions at times run the gamut. And notice it's pointed in faith and asking real, honest questions. And this morning, this, I, I would invite you, if you're dealing with anguish, some sort of struggle, some sort of suffering, or maybe you're here and you're not quite sure you have questions and doubts about faith, here's what I would say to you. Here's a word of comfort. Do you see how Asaph is able to bring his deepest questions and doubts even questions and doubts about God. And we should be, as a as community of faith, we should be able to be honest and, and open and say, hey, yeah, there are some things that I do question about. Or I don't always have 100% faith all the time. I have questions. I have struggles. I have doubts. That's what the psalm invites us. You see, <clears throat> anger says, 
God is not fair and just. Maybe in your mind, the feeling, that this expression, anger says to me, God is not fair or just. Or fear and anxiety says, God, you're not in control. Or my shame says, God, you cannot cover my uncleanness and my nakedness. Or depression may say, God, you left me in my darkest hour. And so this morning, I want to invite you to one very practical question when you're in the midst of, or maybe after you have an, an emotion, whether it is an expression of anger or expression of fear or expression of anxiety or feeling depression, to ask yourself, what is this saying about my faith in God? What is this really revealing about where I believe God is in my life right now? That's a very helpful, practical question to ask yourself in the midst of what you're going to interject faith in the midst of your skepticism in the midst of your doubt in the midst of your fear and anxiety and worry that you can interject where is god the psalms are full of questions like that psalm 22 which we look at how long oh god will you withhold yourself are you going to show up you see these questions reveal my, my emotion reveals what I truly believe about God. And we'll talk about this in a moment, but, and in coming weeks, that there are righteous expressions of emotions. There's righteous anger, right? Biblically, there, is, there are expressions, biblical expressions of emotions that are righteous. But they also point to where I am with the Lord and maybe questions and doubts and skepticism. And God can handle that. Do I believe that God is fair and just? Frederick Bachner, who is an American novelist and a theologian, became a Christian, and he was talking about his writing. And he said this, and this is, this is kind of extrapolates what we're seeing in this psalm. Like any other serious novelist, I try to be as true as I can about life as I've known it. I write not as a protagonist or a propagandist, but as an artist. I write as an artist. On the one hand, and here is where I must feel to be careful, since my ordination, I have written consciously as a Christian, as an evangelist or apologist even. That does not mean that I preach in my novels which would make for neither good novels nor good preaching. On the contrary, I lean over backwards not to. I choose as my characters, or out of my dreams, do they choose me? That's the question. Men and women whose feet are as much of clay as mine are because they are only people, and I can begin to understand as a novelist, no less as a teacher, I try not to stack the deck unduly, but always let doubt and darkness have their say along with faith and hope. Not just because it is good apologetics. Woe to him who tries to make it look simple and easy. But because to do any other way would be less than true to the elements of doubt and darkness that exist in my life no less than others. I am a Christian novelist in the same sense that somebody from Boston or Chicago is an American novelist. I must be true to my experience as a Christian, as black writers to their experience as blacks or women writers as their experience of women. It is no more complicated, no more sinister than that. And what is Bachner saying? He's saying that he writes truth in his novels and he doesn't sugarcoat the struggles in life. And, and I feel like, right, much of Christianity can be sugarcoated. And the Psalms are brutally honest about pain and suffering and anguish and anger and emotion and depressions. 
doesn't sugarcoat it. But they do point to our deepest questions about God and life. And so I would invite us to not just, oh, you know, I'm, I, I'm just an angry person. You know, to be glib about, well, you know, that's just the way that I am. No, it says something. It says something about what you believe about who God is and where he is in your life. We we all have struggles and doubts, and so did the theologian Woody Allen, who said, I'm plagued by doubts. What if everything is an illusion and nothing exists? In that case, I definitely overpaid for my carpet. See, we can be, as believers, we can be honest. How refreshing it is to those that are outside the church to to see followers of Jesus saying, you know what, I don't have it all together. I haven't figured it out. Yeah, I struggle with anger, anxiety, emotion, right? You you don't just bottle that all in and and pretend like the world and the flesh and the devil don't have an impact on your life and that you don't suffer and you don't have those experiences. But it's it's wonderful. It's, It's refreshing to people who are outside the church to say, wow, you're honest about your life. You're honest about your struggles and doubts. It's a good thing. And if you're here this morning that you're new and you're questioning about even faith in general, here's here's a thing. I would invite you to question and doubt your doubts, (laughs) right? The only way to be truly honest is to say, I don't, I haven't figured it all out. And I would invite you to go on this journey with the Psalms with us this summer. But secondly, the, the, that our emotions, our cries, are an expression of our faith. See in verses 10 through 15. Then I said, I appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You made known your might and to the peoples. With you, with your arm, are re- re- redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. And notice here, in the end of the psalm began, I cry aloud to the Lord. Notice that it's directed even in your emotion, even in your fear, even in your anger, in your doubt, let that lead you to crying out to the Lord. This is what Asaph does. He cries out and he says, I appeal to God. And he, and he's not just blowing off steam, right? He's not just venting. That's not what followers of Jesus do. They don't just vent. They don't just blow off steam, hot air, but actually they direct their questions their emotions to God in prayer. Use that in leading them uh, to prayer. The church father, Jerome, said, talking about how unique this is, someone like Asaph or someone like you and me, that we would take our emotions and express them to God in faith. When he says this, it is not always easy to cry out to the Lord. When we think When we were in trouble, we were dejected and think of nothing but our trouble. Yet the best course in time of affliction is to pray earnestly to God. Jerome is highlighting, saying like, "This this is actually, it's unnatural. It's unnatural in a sense that we would take our emotions and cry out to the Lord and ask Him, Lord, What are you doing? Where are you? Meet me where I am. It's unnatural because we're so focused on myself. The last thing I do is to turn in faith and pray. But through the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, which inspired this text and now dwells within you and me, we're able to not just focus on ourselves, but actually turn to the Lord and cry out to Him and ask Him to show up. And the way that we do that is we focus on his attributes. And that's what Asaph does. 
he focuses on the attributes of god and i have three here the first attribute that asaph focuses on is that god is holy god is holy and maybe say well, how's that comforting if i'm depressed if i'm anxious if i'm angry how does a holy god you know conjures up the idea of maybe a god of judgment but i would submit to you that actually it is comforting to know that a god is holy in the midst of what we're experiencing because it means that god is a god who is righteous and he does everything that he does is righteous and it's done in holiness and justice and so we have a god who works justice because he's jealous for his holiness to be made manifest and asaph knows that and he turns to say hey i'm going to dwell on the fact that god is holy it's comforting i've quoted from a, a book before rebecca manley pippard's book hope has its reasons and she says Think how you would feel if you didn't have a God who was holy and just and carrying out his wrath. He says, th she says, think about how we would feel when we see someone we loved ravaged by unwise actions or relationships. Do we respond with, do we respond with benign tolerance as we might towards strangers? Far from it. Anger isn't the opposite of love. Hate is. And the final form of hate is indifference. God's wrath is not a cranky explosion, but his settled opposition to the cancer, which is eating out the insides of the human race he loves with his whole being. And so what Asaph is grasping, here's a God who is holy, and he's going to bring about, and he's going to make things right, and he can appeal to that in faith directing his emotions say god you're holy that's great comfort but secondly he talks about god is great the greatness of god he reflects on god's miracles in verse 11 in verse 12 he talks about the mighty deeds of god and then he says in verse 13 what god is so great as our god who, who can be as great as our God? Is there any comparison? And he's actually alluding to the Exodus. And in Exodus 15, 15, 13, the same language, 15, 11, is actually used. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome and glorious deeds, doing wonders? This is the psalm, this is the song that the Israelites sang coming out of bondage of slavery in Egypt. And they're celebrating their deliverance. And they're saying, what God can do this? Who can be like this God? Only the God, the Lord God of the universe can do this. And Asaph points his emotion and frustrations and says, I need a great God. This is the God that I am going to meditate. This is the God I am going to pray to who is able to do amazing things. But thirdly, he says, this God is loving because he is loving. He says in verse 15, you with your arm redeemed your people. What an expression of love. A God who redeems his people and of course bringing his people out of bondage of slavery into freedom into the promised land what a picture of love that we see in our god and we see this references to jacob talking about israel but also the reference to joseph suggests that they can trust that god is going to fulfill his promises bringing in the promised land if you ever heard the phrase, the best predictor, or maybe you can fill in the blank, the best predictor of future behavior is what? Past behavior, right? And that's exactly what Asaph is saying. Look, I'm in the midst. He's, he's not crying out having gone through it, but he's in the midst of 
the suffering, in the midst of trouble and affliction. And he's saying, I appeal to God and his past behavior as a predictor of what my God will do. And I can trust in confidence and faith. What he did in the past is going to show up in the present and the future. I can have this kind of confidence. I love what Eugene Peterson, who's a pastor of pastors, says this, Christians travel the same ground that everyone else walks on, breathe the same air, drink the same water, shop in the same stores, read the same newspapers, are citizens under the same governments, pay the same prices for groceries and gasoline, fear the same dangers, are subject to the same pressures, get the same distresses, are buried in the same ground. The difference is that each step we walk, each breath we breathe, we know we are preserved by God. We know that we are accompanied by God. We know that we are ruled by God. And therefore, no matter what doubts we endure or what accidents we experience, the Lord will pre preserve us from evil. He will keep our life. Quoting from Psalm 121. So what is Peterson saying? That the uniqueness of faith is that whatever we experience, the only difference between me and my neighbor who does not know the Lord is that I know a Lord who from past behavior is promises that he is going to be faithful in the present and the future of my life. And that's the God that we walk with. The uniqueness of Christianity is that we have, it's a relationship. It's not just praying to some impersonal force or relying on the teachings of some great model teacher, but that Christ came and he fulfilled God's law, it was obedient, died on the cross so that we could have a relationship with him and even bring our struggles and doubts. So thirdly, what is what does... What do our cries reveal? What do they say? The, our cries point us to redemption. Verses 16 through 20 is a summary of the Exodus, a great summary of what God did. And the first thing he says is, when the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. Now, that may just seem a throwaway comment. Or we, we have a, a sober, healthy relationship with the ocean, right? We, we don't just go out there. We, we know the dangers, not only of the, the sharks and whatever else, sea creatures, but the deep itself. But in the Old Testament, in ancient Near East, the waters represented chaos, utter chaos. And you go back to Genesis chapter 1. And the world, the creation, right, is void. And without any kind of order. And God comes along on day two. And he separates the expanse from the waters. God brings order. God alone is able to control the waters. And push them back. And of course, the Israelites will experience that in crossing the Red Sea. He will hold the waters back so that they can cross on dry land. A picture of God's redemption. You know, the, the picture of... Take this, file this away. When you read the events or the account of creation, it is the account of God's creation of the world, but it's also God's account of creation of a people for himself. Actually, Genesis 1 and 2 speak of the Exodus because they, as a people, were formless and void. And God, right, by the forces, brings a people together out of nothing and brings them to himself. Is a picture of great redemption, foreshadowing what God would do through his Son. And so, verses 17 through 20 continue to recount the mighty acts of God in his deliverance of his people through the exodus. 
So why does Asaph do this? Why does he recount the Exodus? Why do writers in the Old Testament always look back to the Exodus account? Because it's a picture of salvation. God, the, this is the greatest event in the Old Testament. God delivering his people out of bondage of slavery in Egypt. And so what do we have to look for? Well, the Apostle Paul says, you know what this account, the Exodus does? It points us to the greater Exodus in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what he says to the Corinthians. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. The Exodus pointed to the greatest, where Jesus would go to the cross and take the wrath and curse of God for our sin so that we would be delivered from bondage to slavery to our sin. In a time interview, Patty Jenkins, uh, the director of Wonder Woman, this was a few years ago, was asked uh, by a interviewer, Belinda Lysacombe, and she said, Wonder Woman has always been a proxy for America, scarily powerful, but a force for good. Did you make love her superpower with current affairs in mind? And the director responds, She's always had stood for truth and love. Her genesis was based on Artemis. However, I do think it is very important right now to celebrate that quality, love. And then the interviewer asks, why? And the director responds, our fantasy of a hero is that he's a good guy who is doing, uh, going to shut down the bad guy. That has got to change if we want to deal with the crisis that we're in. There is no one bad guy. We're all to blame. New kinds of heroics need to be celebrated like love, thoughtfulness, forgiveness, diplomacy, or we're not going to get there. No one is coming to save us. And it's interesting, the director captures two things. Yes, she's absolutely right. We're all to blame. That's our sin. But there is one who came to save us and has and will save us. Guaranteed. God's past behavior, the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees that he will come again and renew all things and put things right. And so as we express, as we experience that, that emotion, that anger that you have with your kids, that outburst that you have with your kids, not that anybody has experienced that, but the anger that you have with your kids or your spouse or at your work or the frustration or the feelings of despair and depression. There is hope. There is hope that God is going to renew all things. And that's guaranteed through the death and resurrection of His Son. I remember speaking to a young man who was struggling. He was as a failure, feeling a failure as a father, failure as a husband. All the things were kind of flooding his mind. And this was a follower of Jesus. He was a believer, but he struggled with doubts that and and fears and anxiety over the fact of, of these things. And in the midst of the conversation, one of the things that strikes me from this psalm, that speaks to that situation, and may speak to you this morning. And that is this. If you're only riding on your emotions, you're on, you better hold on for dear life because it is a roller coaster ride. But what Asaph does for us is he takes that emotion and he looks at the objective truth of our God. And that's what he hangs on to. And that's what he builds his life on. The objective reality that there is a God who does redeem and he does meet us where we are 
and our struggles and doubts. And so as we engage in this series, let's begin by practicing whatever emotion uh, that you experienced this week that you would actually ask yourself, what is this saying? What do I believe about God? And then also express that to God and say, God, this is what I'm wrestling with. Will you be faithful in the way that you've been in the past? You know, that's what the God's, preaching the gospel is all, to ourselves is all about. You preach the gospel to yourself. You, you remind yourself of what God has done in the midst of that moment. And it can bring you great hope in the midst of what you're struggling. It may not alleviate the circumstances or questions or doubts at that moment, but there is hope to be inter interjected, faith to be interjected in the midst of the struggles and questions and doubts that we have. You see, the scriptures are like an ophthalmologist, you know, that prescribes, uh, diagnoses you and puts the right glasses on that you can see life through the lens like that it's meant to be and that's what scripture does it's like a lens that you put on that you can see the lenses of through the lenses of faith that even though you may not see in this moment right now the way out god is going to meet you where you are let's pray father we thank you for the promise the promises of your scripture thank you for the freedom of expressing our questions and doubts to you uh, lord while we don't have it all figured out that we have a God who has and will make everything right. I pray, Lord, for anyone who is suffering and struggling this morning, that, they, that you would meet them. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. stand
Father in heaven, you will not forget to be gracious. Your promises are steadfast and are ever true. Lord, you will not withhold your kindness toward us. For you are able and you are willing to comfort us in our sorrow, to hold us when we're scared, to take us in your arms when we're anxious, Lord, you are faithful and true. And we read today, Lord, that you are holy. We just sang that you are holy, holy, Lord God Almighty. And you are great. As we read, you, you pull back the waters and you let your people walk through on dry ground. No footprints in the mud, but it was solid and firm as they walked through. And Lord, uh, more than that, you take us through you take us through death and worthy is the lamb who was slain to make a way lord that we can be washed clean through the water that we can be clean from our sins lord that uh, we have our salvation for you are great and lord you are loving lord you uh, you care for us even if we're not worthy, even if we feel that we're not worthy. Uh, you made us in your image, Father, and you called us to be your people set apart. Lord, we thank you for who you are, that you are great, that you are holy, that you are loving. In Jesus' name, amen.
all names, sing that again. Name above all names, worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great is our. Maybe you're here this morning, you're struggling with something, maybe big, maybe minor. We have prayer available in the room just to out the doors there. We can direct you. So I encourage you to take advantage of that. Have somebody pray with you. Cry out to the Lord with you. You go now with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do you have a seat for just a few announcements? As always, the announcements are in the worship folder. They're in the newsletter. You can check out our website, our Facebook page, and anywhere else you can find Harvest Fellowship to find out what's going on. But I want to highlight just a few things. Today is the fourth Sunday of the month, which means it's Nursing Home Visit Day. See Bob Sharenko if you have any questions, if you'd like to participate. We're also making birthday cards for those in the nursing home who have birthdays in July, and, and you can see the list of people whose birthdays are coming up in the worship folder there. If you want to make them a card and bring it next week and turn that in, we'd appreciate that as well. And then the last one I want to highlight here is the uh, Tropical Summer Celebration coming up on July 16th. Natalie, Natalie leads the D2D team who's kind of sponsoring this and putting it on, but they need some help. There's some things listed here that uh, you might be interested in helping us out with, monitoring and restocking the food table during the event, a couple of people to lead some relay races for fun uh, for those who are there, and then uh, helping with setup and cleanup. If you are interested in participating at all, if you would be available to serve in that way, please see Natalie and uh, she will uh, point you in the right direction as to what needs to be done. That's all I've got. Thank you very much. Have a great Sunday. Mm -hmm.